Uh, philosophy is very simple, is to try to give the passengers a better product. De normen voor dat betere product bepaalde Nicky zelf. Aan boord serveert hij maaltijden uit een Wins toprestaurant, omdat hij daar zelf zo lekker had gegeten. Eigenaar Attila Dokudan hanteert dezelfde normen voor perfectie en stijl als Lauda. Dogudan has been a very good coincidence because uh, a couple of years ago I met him and I realized at the time that if you don't do something different in the airplanes you will not succeed. So we started that business together and uh, it's doing very very well. And we started with one aircraft a day, that means with 250 meals or 200 meals uh, and increased weekly until now 5 or 6 thousand meals a day at the average. De maatschappij heeft een omzet van meer dan 1 en een kwart miljoen dollar per jaar. 900 man personeel en 8 toestellen. Een negende is in bestelling. Lauda fungeert veelal zelf als gezagvoerder. Ik denk dat hands-on business is the best. I hate to operate like a lot of other airlines where you have six levels of, of bullshit between the top management and the passengers. I think to I like to go and see problems myself. Therefore, I fly on a regular basis to 767 and the 737 because as soon as I see a problem, I come home and correct it. 50. 30. Naast zijn directeursfunctie maakt Lauda een volledige werkweek als gezagvoerder. Maar hij vindt ook nog altijd tijd voor zijn oude liefde, de racerij. Ferrari wist geen race meer te winnen, daarom contacteerde ze de legendarische Lauda als adviseur. To be really quick and motivated, you have to be happy, everything has to be absolutely right, because then your head and your heart can go right over the limit. If something is wrong, you won't take the chance, because you know very well if you do a mistake, uh, you're in troubles. So you really need to be ready to be in troubles, but in a good, positive spirit. Zijn enorme ervaring maakt hem bij uitstek geschikt om jonge coureurs de fijne kneepjes van het racen bij te brengen. Lauda's stelregel bij Ferrari is, je moet alleen gaan racen als je wilt winnen. Die instelling kan Ferrari aan de top terugbrengen. Want haar huidige reputatie is alleen nog gebaseerd op vergane glorie. Niet op recente resultaten. Wereldkampioen Lauda had zijn reputatie zowel aan de pers te danken als aan zijn gewaagde rijstijl. De media waren gek met de kampioen, die als echte Weense charmeur de hand kuste van prinses Gracia van Monaco. Desondanks kreeg hij het stempel Killer Rotzak opgedrukt. Ook het noodlot sloeg toe. Ik herinner me heel goed nog steeds. Er was veel vuur en fire and smoke. En we konden zien één driver running around the wreckage. Which I was under the impression it was Roger Williams. After the race, the journalist came to me and said, uh, Roger Williams died in that accident. I said, yes, I was nearly crying because I knew the guy very well. And he kept on pushing. He said, listen, how can you drive there if somebody dies? I said, listen, simply I did not believe he was still in there. And he kept on going, kept on going, really being very nasty to me in a very sad moment. So I said, listen, hold it now, you idiot. The last sentence is, I'm not here for a firefighting mission. I'm here to drive and please shut up now and leave. So he just took that last part of my 10 minutes talk with him and published this, which was completely wrong to the situation because this was never what I really said. In zijn vele jaren bij Ferrari moest Lauda menig conflict uitvechten met zijn baas, de licht ontvlambare, echte Italiaan Enzo Ferrari. So he definitely was one of the two or three uh, major persons who ever uh, dared to oppose openly to, to Enzo Ferrari. That's, that's for sure. So I went into his office and told him the car is no good. So he looked at me in a very bad way, I admit, and he said, okay, you have one chance, tell me what's wrong, and if you go quicker, you made it, if you don't go quicker, you're out. 
So I said, shit, you know, I put myself not in a very good position. Lauda had zichzelf weer eens geen keus gelaten. Om zijn alom benijde plaats bij de beste racestal van de wereld te behouden, moest hij winnen. Maar dat lag hem wel. Als de druk het grootst was, presteerde hij juist goed. Zijn strijd met Enzo Ferrari duurde voort. Maar hij won de ene na de andere race, zodat hij in 1975 voor het eerst wereldkampioen werd. Het seizoen daarop begon Nicky met het trotse nummer 1 op zijn auto. De racewereld verwachtte dat hij dat nog jaren zou behouden. Augustus 1976 op de Nuenburgring. I lost my helmet and I was uh, unconscious in the car for about 55 seconds with 800 degrees of fire around me and uh, three of my colleagues pulled me out of the car. I then went uh, I got flown to the intensive care in Germany. I was about uh, three days uh, touch and go to stay alive because of my lung damage I had of inhalating all these flames and fumes. And then I had some surgeries uh, in my face to get my uh, skin back on, which was totally burned down. And uh, it took me, I think, four and a half weeks to recover. I think that was one of the, 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 the main uh, er, um, periods in, in his life, this, uh, this uh, fantastic will to, to fight and to stick to, to his new face and to stick to, to the new condition. Willy Dongli played, I would say, the most important part because simply you need... Uh, he was there, for example, thinking day and night how to overcome my... my Burns in the head and then all this. And in Gelenken had I noch mehr ausgeschaut, the ganze Kopf was so groß and dick. And you must see that it's not the die passive passivity that is the Krankheit überlassen, but I must ständig motivieren, I must the ganzen Tag irgendetwas tun. He had in Kopf had er über 70 verbrannte Trümmerstücke von der Balaklava drinnen gehabt in der Haut und die mussten wir mit der Pinzette herausholen und das wieder mit ätherischen Ölen ausbrennen und ihn dann wieder bewegen, dass die Gelenke nicht steif werden. So he was there at this one time to treat my, my burns and damage I had and at the other time to start training again. So this combination really uh, made me possible to race after five weeks. I remember very well going down to Monza to my first race. And uh, on the Friday, first practice, I went out of the pits and uh, I changed into second gear and I couldn't drive it. I was so frightened and I tell you, I nearly shit it in my pants because I was so frightened of um, driving these cars because all the, ra all the accident came back. So I went uh, very slowly one lap and then um, came back into the pits and just stopped, I couldn't do it. So the next day, I came back and I told myself, there is no race. You just go to Monza if there would be no race. You just take your time and try to get speed up again and, and get confident in my capabilities of driving these Formula 1 cars. I mean, a German Bild Zeitung, they had stories on him, they were just unbelievable. And, um, and people in press conferences used to ask him, uh, is your wife now going to get a divorce and, and things like that. And he had to go through it. And this made him incredibly tough. I mean, Ferrari didn't behave very well. It, in, in those days, they, they tried to, to replace him. And, uh, and he, he really had to fight against Ferrari as well. Ferrari was a very egocentric man. All he wanted is to win, which I agree with him. So as soon as he found some weakness, and I certainly had my weaknesses after the accident, he signed up right and right away. And uh, he actually at some time did not believe that they will come back. So really all his future was based on Regazzoni and Reutemann, but suddenly I was back. And then I must say I had my difficult times to establish my position again, which I thought a little bit unfair because I've proved that I can win championships for him. Het gevecht om terug te komen had hem veranderd. 
In Japan stapte hij uit omdat hij de veiligheid onvoldoende vond en liet de zegen aan James Hunt, iets wat niemand van Lauda had verwacht. En ik geloof heute nog dat een product dieses trainings het verhalen in Fuji was. Dat hij het rennen afgebroken had en uitgestiegen had, omdat hij zijn leven en zijn gezondheid een gewissen schwerpunkt en een gewicht gegeven had. Hunt werd met één punt voorsprong wereldkampioen. Lauda vond het best. No, I still have no regrets because I would do the same thing today. Sure, I lost one championship, but I maybe saved my life. He he gained all all the force which he which he needed in in the years to come. He gained in these um, three to five months of uh, 76. Het eerste resultaat van zijn inspanning kwam al snel. Nicky won. Na James Hunt in 1977 te hebben verslagen en voor de tweede maal wereldkampioen te zijn geworden, ging Nicky weg bij Ferrari. Dankzij de ontwikkelingen die Nicky op gang had gebracht, bleef de stal aan de winnende hand. Nicky tekende voor twee seizoenen bij het Engelse Brabham. Zijn wil om te winnen was nog even sterk, maar er was ook een goede wagen voor nodig. De Brabhams hadden allerlei problemen. Het racen had een beetje afgedaan en Lauda ontwikkelde nieuwe plannen. Grootse plannen. I saw it was really serious. He was from the very beginning, he was thinking very big. I just uh, was in the way of starting Lauda Air, which my head was already turned away from Formula One. So I went to Canada, I started uh, practice, I drove for three laps and that shit, you know. I can't do it anymore. And I just stopped, went to Ecclestone and said uh, goodbye. <laughs> I just left, went to California and discussed about a DC-10 airplane. It was an obsession. No question. He was thinking at this time always in planes, in airlines. But I underestimated completely the power uh, our Austrian Airlines boss here and our government had just to stop everybody flying. I thought I was living in a western country, but it was uh, worse than the worst east. The government believed at that time there's only one airline here in Austria who is allowed to fly, which is their own. That's why. Ein Irrtum. Es gibt in Österreich kein Gesetz, das besagt, Österreich darf nur eine Airline haben. Suddenly, everything started working against me. The first thing was the tax. Wir haben aufgedeckt seine Verbindungen zu Hongkong-Firmen, zu Briefkastenfirmen äh, und er musste sehr viel Steuern nachzahlen damals. And the mistake I did at that time, I just started Lauda Air because I just retired and I said, okay, if I want to start now with Lauda and I need permissions from the government and so on, okay, I pay this tax, which I think was completely wrong that they can ask under these circumstances for me to pay tax. Das war eigentlich schon von Anfang an, dass sich die Austrian Airlines, die österreichische staatliche Luftfahrtgesellschaft, uh, auf Niki Lauda voll eingeschossen hat. And at the same time, the army came back. I was 33 years old and you only can get into there until 34, I think. <coughs> so one morning I had this uh, piece of paper said uh, go and report to the army. Weil uh, der Rennfahrer Niki Lauda nicht in der Lage war, das österreichische Bundesheer als Soldat seine Pflicht zu tun. Er war zu krank, das habe ich selbst damals sehr stark kritisiert. A little army man came to me and said, Lauda, morning. I hope there's nothing wrong if the Austrian television is going to uh, film whatever. Okay, if you want that, I don't care, I'm here to do whatever is necessary to do, like every other Austrian. Anyway, they checked me out. Final report was, uh, we can't have you because of your uh, damage from your uh, uh, Nürburgring accident. If you wear a helmet, it will not stay up because of your ear here, so it's, it's going to be, it was quite funny actually. Uh, and therefore, you, we can't accept you. Er hat ihn immer als gefährlichen Konkurrenten betrachtet, äh, hat alles daran getan, politisch, um Niki Lauda äh, nicht hochkommen zu lassen oder noch deutlicher gesagt, um Niki Lauda umzubringen. Wäre fast gelungen. Es hat mich 10 Jahre gebraucht, um dieses Problem zu überwinden. Und es war wirklich ein unbelievable Kampf. Und all diese Dinge, die ich dir gesagt habe, wie Tax und Dinge, ist alles inkludiert, sogar die militärische Dinge, von meinem Punkt aus. In die moeilijke tijd ontwikkelde hij zoiets als het Lauda-systeem. 
numerical lauda system means um, gaining uh, gaining time by avoiding um, useless uh, frills of everyday life and um, coming to the point very strict and very quick and uh, enforcing the the speed of, of whatever you are doing to the to the other people I have certainly been brought up in a way that I don't like to screw around uh, with unnecessary things so I'd like to come to the point do the correct thing and right thing take the time which is necessary but then get on to the next one so I don't, it. I don't like to waste time in a way he is very uh, doubtful person as as, uh, as any intelligent person, but he can deal with his uh, doubts, and he can uh, then leave them behind, and he can emerge uh, of the situation as a as a man who knows uh, what to do. Yeah, I think I do a very simple and logic approach to things. I mean, if I look back into my Formula One career, I started with a mini Cooper doing hill climb races, so I won them all. So the logic next step was is to get a Porsche. And, and to the next thing, after the Porsche, it was Formula 3, Formula 2, Formula 1. So, it is not that I said I want to be world champion in Formula 1. I wanted to drive the Mini the best possible way, then the Porsche, and so on. It was van belang om stapsgewijze te werk te gaan. Als een kind dat leert lopen. When I was 10 years old, I started driving all sort of tractors and lorries and cars. Uh, therefore, my school uh, operation uh, was handicapped in a way, and... Um, I was very bad in school, I must say. And my parents and my grandfather pushed me like crazy to uh, make the Abitur uh, when you are 18 to finish that sector of school. One day when I was in school, that the lady next to me, uh, she just showed me her uh, Zeugnis so that she finished the school. So the guy behind me said, uh, why don't you take this uh, and we put your name on top, take her name out and uh, here you've, you've done it show it to your parents. And I thought that's a great idea, I did it that way. Came home, showed from the distance uh, my modified uh, diploma. Whole family happy, really, that uh, I finally succeeded in school. And they left me alone. Stop, hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going now. Eindelijk vrij om te racen, leerde hij de harde racewereld pas goed kennen. I think this is also part of my character today that I was uh, strictly racing for half of my life, very competitive sport, easy to see uh, number one is the first, second is the second, so no excuses, you have to, you're responsible for yourself, you have to push the throttle and the more you push it, the better you are, the other results. And really that was it, so I, I, I jumped out of a secured childhood straight into a tough business when I was 18 on my own, and I think this was the best thing I could do. Volledig in overeenstemming met zijn Lauda systeem neemt Nicky regelmatig de tijd om zich te ontspannen. Hij heeft vrienden die hem kennen, menen te kennen althans. He's more a loner than an uh, egoistic, well, he is of course very egoistic and, and you can't be there when he is if you are a hell of an egoistic uh, guy and, and he, I'm sure he would stick to that. I don't think so. If I, for example, talk to some women, because the, the, the people always say the men are so egoistic, I mean, I'm very often astonished, uh, especially in the company here, for example, what power women can develop when they want to do something. So I know that I'm egocentric and egoistic in a way, but sometimes if I look at other people, even some women here, I said, Jesus Christ, I could learn a lot from them. <laughs> he is a person. He's a little bit egoist, but not his friends. Like 10 years ago, he would, uh, if you asked him, um, do you have uh, many friends? He would say, no, I have none. No, in Formula One there is no real friendship. I mean, uh, the principle of Formula One is to beat the other guy. So to beat your best friend is not really the way to go. But there are certain drivers uh, which like each other and certain drivers which hate, hate each other. But a real friendship, the way we, we see it, I don't think it's possible. When I retired, I was not even interested to look at it in television. I had so enough from Formula One that um, 
there was nothing there at all. And then after a year and a half, then I suddenly was interested to watch a Grand Prix again in television. Then I went to Monza to look myself, and suddenly uh, it came back. The reason I went back simply is that really what I've expected out of my second life going into this aviation business was wrong because I could not break the power here the government had. So, but I knew that I will never give up on that project. So I said, I have to wait. And waiting, doing nothing is boring. So I said, okay, I motivated myself to see if, if after two years not driving, you can do a comeback. So in the end I said, okay, I went up to Donington. Uh, John Watson was there, he did a couple of laps. Uh, I was right away four seconds slower. I had no condition at all to hold the steering wheel and so on. So I was not happy at the time, but I drove all day long. And then in the end I was quicker and, and, and I said, I can, I think I can do it again. So I asked my, my amount I wanted at the time. And uh, the argument was, uh, we don't know if you're going to be good enough to, to ask for this amount of money. <coughs> so I said, okay. Then give me a three months contract if you want, you see how I drive. I went to the second or third race and won it. So suddenly they said, shit, you know, he can still drive. So I went again to Lausanne to negotiate. And uh, I asked for the same amount of money. And I said, I want another million dollars on top. So they said, are you crazy? Why? So for driving. Because you only paid me for PR work. In the previous years, you gave me a three months contract, but you didn't believe in my driving, so you must pay for driving. So in the end, I got my money because they really screwed themselves in their own system, and it was a fantastic contract at the time. In 1984 werd Nicky voor de derde keer wereldkampioen met de onmisbare steun van zijn vriend en gezondheidsguru, professor Willy Dungel. Deze had meer dan tien jaar onderzoek gedaan naar de mentale en lichamelijke stress bij autocoureurs. Nicky onderwierp zich volledig aan de vaak onconventionele methode van Dunkel. We hebben 1976 Messungen gemacht. We hebben 220 Puls beim Rennen festgesteld. Voor 30 jaar had men nog geleerd. Bij 220 begint de bewustlosigheid. Wenn Nicky Lauda zum Beispiel gegen Alain Prost gefahren is. En had Prost enige Zehntel van Körpergewicht bei gleichen Auto Vorteil. So musste ich einmal schauen, wie weit kann ich mit dem Körpergewicht herunter, dass trotzdem seine Leistungsfähigkeit und Sicherheit bleibt, aber dass er keinen Ballast mitnimmt. Zwei, ein Jahr haben wir einen Professor mitgehabt, der Blutanalysen gemacht hat, wie viel Elektrolyte braucht er. Müssen wir ihm eine Flasche ins Cockpit geben oder nicht? Wir haben einmal in Südafrika in einem Rennen 2,80 Kilo Flüssigkeitsverlust gehabt. Und trotzdem haben die Mineralien gestimmt, weil wir ihn vorher zeitgerecht bilanziert hatten. Thomas Green was the World Championship in 84 by half point of Ireland Prost in Portugal. It was very close and it worked out. Lifestyle today is uh, different, but the principle is the same. So I know exactly when my body or my head is getting tired, so I know exactly when to go to bed and not to stay up long and things like this. I try to eat sensible but not as as correct as I did in the past. Ja, wir sind ihm drauf gekommen, dass das eine besonders gute Mischung für ihn ist. Am Morgen Joghurt mit Apfel oder am Abend Erdbeeren und solche. Nicky heeft de afgelopen 17 jaar dus elke dag precies hetzelfde ontbijt genuttigd. Een schaaltje yoghurt met aardbeien. for work and most of the time is Vienna now because here's my work. Family, wife and two children are in Salzburg which uh, I go on a regular basis over the weekends or whenever it's time and so I commute between uh, Salzburg and Vienna really. 
Uh, I was never married in the sense of people think to be married, that you are every day at home and you play with a wife and with the children and so on. So I married uh, when I was uh, in 1976. I had my accident right after I got married. So my wife said, this is uh, a bit stupid to what you do as a racing driver. So she never came with me. So therefore we established a sort of marriage which uh, she likes and I like. It's, it's not that I'm every day at home. The children are used to this uh, sort of life, so they never complain. So when I come home, everybody seems to be happy. It gives me really all the freedom to do whatever I want. I really don't have to think, shit, I can't go here, I can't go there, because family or children or whatever, I can do anything I like. Even if I'm a, like if I would have been a single and I'm still married, so it's, it's, it's good. I always want to drive a car on the road which I like. I mean, this is really the, the most important thing. And today I like uh, a Mercedes, for example, which uh, I like to look as a normal car, but it goes like hell. So therefore I have this 500E, which is a very nice car. It looks like a taxi, but it goes like a, like a Ferrari. And uh, this is what I like. So cars do mean still a lot. Uh, I went to Mini, uh, to British, uh, whoever, Rover now, and, and asked them uh, if I can have a car. So I actually wanted two cars, to be honest, because I have two sons. One is 13 and one is 11. So I thought, 25 years ago I started with a Mini, so I want to repeat. But in life you can't repeat things that easy. So anyway, I got my first Mini now, and I was really happy when I saw that little red thing. And uh, they delivered it to the airport, and Mercedes was out of the question, and I jumped into the Mini one evening, brand new, and drove towards the city on the autobahn. And halfway down the autobahn, the Mini goes slow. I push the throttle, I check, everything is okay. So I keep on going, it was going up and down all the time. And I didn't know at the time what it is. But then I realized there were so strong winds, gusty winds, that that Mini, which has no power, the wind nearly stopped it. Net als de auto's waarin hij rijdt, zal Niki Lauda altijd een grote naam blijven, waar mensen zich graag mee associëren. It's quite funny, I had a, a coincidence where I came to a family which uh, had two little kids there. I think they were, must have been about six and eight years old, the boy and the, and the girl. And when I came into the room, they didn't know me that I was there at all, and then they were just there. The little boy said to me, I know you. So I said, where do you know me from? Ah, because um, you are a racing driver and you burned your ear. Yes, I said, yes, right, but he... He must have never seen me because he's six years old or something and I retired uh, many years ago. <clears throat> and then the girl said, I know you too. You had a terrible airplane crash. You know, so I thought, shit, you know, this, the, the kids are, I have for everyone something. And the room can to gelder worden gemaakt. For flinke vergoedingen voert Nicky zijn eigen stukje PR op. Money is, is important for Nicky. Uh, but the most important is to spend less money. The story is for the sweets from, from Boss. He is so happy that for PR or whatever, it costs him nothing. But he is flying with his jet. So the jet, if you count, it costs much more than, t than two trousers or pullovers. But he has it for nothing, that's perfect. Uh, the watch is the, the same thing <laughs> out of Formula One. And the best deal I have in Vienna is with Do Co. Because uh, he's my caterer and I said as long as you cater me I can have uh, free lunch and dinner with you. The car is, uh, is, uh, is again something I can use. So I don't, I don't spend money. Na de racerij wil de Lauda zijn loopbaan een nieuwe richting geven. De luchtvaart fascineerde hem nog steeds, maar voor een nieuw begin had hij krachtige relaties nodig. In 84, suddenly the biggest client of Austrian Airlines, Mr. Vavaresos, saw me in Salzburg and said, why are you not uh, starting your airline again? And I said, okay, if you be my partner and come into Lauda Air with your 40,000 passengers, okay, we do it. And then we decided right away not to fly below or above Austin Islands. Then we bought 737s and we just flew right against them. Er hat also Kontakte mit Boeing aufgenommen, hat dort 
Wenn Sie mich fragen, perfekt und sensationelle Verträge abgeschlossen. Äh, sensationell auch, was das Risiko betrifft. Aber er war bekannt und ein Rennfahrer als Airliner und Boeing, das war eine, eine, eine besondere Situation. Boeing hat ihm sehr geholfen. Ich erinnere mich, wenn wir den ersten 737, den wir das 300 und wenn der Airplane got painted, war ich da. Blue Jeans uh, with my cap, like I'm here today. And I asked one of the Boeing guys to do things a little different. And he looked at me and said, who are you? I mean, how can you tell me? I said, I'm the owner of this aircraft. So he was completely astonished that the owner is there and, and uh, tells them how to do things. Lauda Air was terug, sterker en krachtiger dan ooit, met hoge kwaliteit voor een redelijke prijs. De maatschappij groeide snel, met bestemmingen over de hele wereld. Na tientallen jaren een monopolie te hebben bezeten, moest de nationale luchtvaartmaatschappij zich bij de feiten neerleggen. Lauda had zijn positie op de Oostenrijkse markt veroverd. Ook hier golden de simpele regels van het Lauda systeem. Er kan er maar één winnen. races he, he tried always to be perfect in his airline business he's trying always to be perfect because it's, he knows that's his only way to, to survive de moordende concurrentie in de luchtvaart versla je niet door simpel van a naar b te vliegen goed opgeleid personeel en een perfecte service verhogen het imago van de maatschappij en zorgen voor klantenbinding I don't want to have it uh, very colorful. The people are colorful. The color of the face, the shirts, you know, from green to blue. So in the moment, two people are in the plane. The interior of the plane is completely changed. De grote baas houdt alles nauwlettend in de gaten. Hij stimuleert zijn mensen, maar maakt het ze ook wel eens moeilijk. Sometimes it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. If you as a professional like to deal with professionals, then you are it's first address for you. If you have the same way of thinking, then it's easy to work with him. From employees I expect, and that's uh, the difficult part, that they always try to do a better job than, than, than they are supposed to do. Because I think a private airline like Lauda is, we can only survive if, if we do things better than the big airlines. Het personeel houdt strenge normen aan, omdat er gepresteerd moet worden. Dat is een regel binnen het Lauda systeem. Nick is a tyrann, a despot. He uses his people. The people of Nicky Lauda have to give the last for their chef. But the boss rests even more on his laurels. He works just as hard as everyone. What I don't like is if people take no decisions. Even if they take the wrong decision, it's better to take a decision than to take no decisions. So I think the quick and straight approach is what really I'm trying to tell everybody. Don't do nothing. Do something. One way or the other. Het Lauda systeem werkt, net als in zijn racetijd. Ook de mensen om hem heen worden erdoor aangestoken. Viele junge mensen, aber auch für ältere, is es eine Ehre. Für Lauda fliegen zu dürfen, weil sie, weil sie eine, eine Beziehung zu ihm haben. You have to uh, understand also the, 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 the troubles Lauda had in the past in the way of getting established, because I had to fight here against uh, the government for many years, I had to even sue them. Uh, this long fight, a lot of people were involved, so, so they all stick together and, and, and they have a Lauda spirit. Lauda zocht iets beters dan het rennende engeltje als symbool. Dus begon Hannes Raus eens met wat ideeën te goochelen. If there are no crocodiles, if there are no lions, we have no lions, or elephants, they are gone within years, we know. There will be reds, it's true. So it was no question that he is a red. And 
He said, I tell you, I'm no red. I don't see me like this. I don't want to be a red. Uh, forget it. <laughs> In the meantime, I think he agreed that it is right. And our animal, if you look at our red, sympathetic animal, philosophic animal. Nicky maakt deel uit van de Ferrari-legende en heeft, na enige aarzeling, de uitdaging aanvaard om het stijgerende paard zijn oude glans terug te geven. De stal heeft behoefte aan een stratege, een man met een visie. Met zijn grote raceervaring is Lauda daarvoor de juiste man. Wat ik doe is, omdat de Monte Tremolo in hier komt, wat ik heel goed weet, is het heel makkelijk om hem te helpen in een manier van strategische beslissingen te adviseren wat het beste ding voor ons voor de toekomst is. Het Lauda-systeem moet Ferrari er weer bovenop helpen. Weg met overbodige franje, ter zake de gedrevenheid overdragen op anderen. Het is zeker dat als je een champion aan zijn kant hebt, et qui ne court pas, qui, qui est là juste pour donner ses, ses conseils. C'est beaucoup plus facile pour un pilote comme moi qui n'a qui pas, un, pas une grande expérience. Donc j'arrive avec lui à, à lui demander deux, trois trucs et puis euh, il me donne des conseils. Reze est net als zaken doen. Het succès komt na vallen en opstaan. In de racerij is testen essentieel. Alleen volledige inzet en absolute concentratie leiden tot succes. First you need to be talented. I mean you need to drive. You need to know how to drive racing cars. And the rest is hard work to develop yourself, to have discipline, to find a new way of driving, to find a new way of going through corners, to find a new way of going quicker. Iedere uitdaging tot het uiterste aangaan, de risico's aanvaarden en je volledig in dienst van je einddoel stellen. Dat vereist volledige toewijding en die toewijding betekent de absolute verantwoordelijkheid aanvaarden. So I think if you see in the middle of the Thailand jungle your airplane there with 223 people spread over 5 kilometer area, I mean it's something I don't want anybody to go through this. I mean, incredibly emotional, incredibly emotional, and, and he had to, uh, to deal with his emotions on the one uh, side and an absolutely professional attitude to, to solve whatever had to be solved then, to, to deal with all the problems, with, with millions of problems coming up. It's his name, it was his company, and uh, Lauda is Niki Lauda, is the person. So. It was really for me obvious and straightforward thinking that if this is my fault, my fault in the way of Lauda's fault, then I'm not capable of running in airline. So I have to take my decision and, and go home. And I said it uh, publicly, which, which I still would do the same thing today, because I think this is the only way to approach things. I mean, if you are responsible for something, then you have to be responsible in a proper way that you can guarantee that, that what you give to people, they really get. But I think nobody is able in, uh, to solve the problem as Nikkei has done it at this time. He was tough and he gave uh, really power to his own uh, staff and to the company. And he did a really good media work. That means he informed with all news the, the medias. Uh, yeah, I think nobody will do it in this way. This had with the Erziehung to do. Man muss denken, sein Großvater war der Industriechef von Österreich. Sein Vater war ein Großpapierfabrikant. Und dort hat immer nur die Rationalität und die Ökonomie regiert. Und 
Er ist dann aus dem Ganzen ausgebrochen, aber das hat er doch von seiner Jugend mitbekommen. Und so wie er halt ein Mensch auch ist, der ganz einfach die Regung nicht zeigt. Ich glaube, wer ihn nach dem Flugzeugunfall gesehen hat, hat vielleicht geglaubt, ihn berührt das nicht. Ja, dass er immer versteckt bei sich getragen hat. And the way how he managed to uh, to uh, control his emotions uh, and uh, on the other hand uh, not not getting cynical or or um, or uh, not caring, which he never did, and in this case especially not uh, that was um, a masterpiece of of his life. I think it was uh, it was the masterpiece of his life. I am frightened, then I can hide. Het ongeluk was te wijten aan een fout in het ontwerp van een onderdeel van de motor. Lauda R trof geen enkele blaam. Een challenge is, geloof ik, er wordt tegen Austrian Airlines en een weltweiten Kampf aufnehmen. Den kann er nicht gewinnen, aber er wird es versuchen. Und vielleicht gewinnt er ihn sogar, ja. Denkmöglich ist alles. So I think there will be four or five air, airlines will be left over for, uh, for the whole of Europe. And if you're not part of one of them, I think you could be in trouble. So therefore Lufthansa was the best combination for us, first of all because of the geographical situation. And then our horizon suddenly went much bigger because we can start flying now with Lufthansa, Vienna, Munich, Los Angeles. Und wenn dann irgendwann einmal die Lufthansa ihre Rechte auch nach New York ausdehnt, dann ist es ist total Kampf. I very seem to always concentrate on something 100%. I never go half and half. So uh, airline is everything today. And maybe one day it stops completely, and then there might be something else, I don't know, or I do this for the rest of my life, this is very hard to say. But I've never done one thing and another one next to it, and half and half. But this is not the, the, the way I operate, so 100% or nothing. But I'm sure that the time will come, that the company will run really well, and he will look around and say, okay, what are I doing next? And I think in the next two years he will ask this question. Maybe the next three weeks. <coughs> really, this is um, something interesting, to be honest. Uh, it's interesting you bring it up, because I must say, as soon as this um, Lufthansa deal, which I worked on, was announced, you get this vacuum, you know what I mean? There's something you work hard for, and then you get it. And then you say, shit, what's up now? And um, I had this crazy idea that you could do something with the railway, because the railway is very, very connected to airplanes. And um, let's say we have a louder train, for example. We could feed straight into the airport and then fly on to Sydney. So the railroad here in Austria is a complete disaster. I mean, they, they lose money like crazy and the performance is bad. So this, this is quite an interesting thing. We've been thinking about it, but I think it's a difficult job. But I, I, I see this as a real good addition to flying. I think I'm generally speaking a happy person because um, I really like what I can do. I can be miserable, for example. I mean, this is uh, a no normal human uh, being. But generally speaking, I like my life and I think that's that's the most important thing. <laughs>